Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Depending on where you're connecting from, this music is kind of kind of like hypnotizing, right? This uh, countdown. <laughs> it's very, very interesting. I know Dimitri loves this music. But uh, great to have you here. Uh, we have with us uh, Dimitri Vestashev, uh, BlackBerry Most Distinguished uh, Threat Researcher. How are you, Dimitri? Good, and thank you, Isma. And good, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. And we have a special guest with us, Vicente. Vicente Diaz, uh, Vital Soul Threat Intelligence Strategist. How are you, Vicente? Hey, thank you for inviting me. Excellent. Well, we're going to be talking about what's cooking in the world of malware. But before we get started with the conversation, I want to acknowledge uh, our audience because uh, we know that there's people connecting from all over the world. And uh, they, they want to know more about threat research, about you know what's happening in the world of malware, cybersecurity in general. Uh, we want to keep these uh, conversations uh, open and uh, interactive. So please, if you have any questions uh, for, for any of us, uh, put it on the chat. We're going to be monitoring that. And uh, uh, hola, Hugo, how are you from Chile? Very nice. We have a bunch of... Uh, Spanish speaking, uh, you know, people joining us today. <laughs> Excellent. Well, uh, we're going to talk about what's cooking. But before we go and talk about malware, since um, I don't know, when I talk about cooking, especially at this time of the day now here on the East Coast, we're going to get into lunch. I'm starting to think about food. So uh, any of you are good cooks or do you do you enjoy cooking? <laughs> I invite Vicente to first. <laughs> Me? Um, I enjoy when I have the time and like on the weekend when I need to cook for my kids and things like that. I hate it because it usually is <laughs> rushing and trying to grab something and feed the kids. And But yeah, if I have the time, I, I'm not very good at this, I should confess. But I like, like you know, it's like following this recipe and hoping for something to happen recipes i like that like just googling right for something and then then trying to to come up with uh, something quick how about you dimitri yeah well it's time right sometimes there's no time to do that but yeah like a you know grill <laughs> it's great <laughs> also with a good wine red dry wine and grill it's always great it matches you know that's a good combination yeah i know i know you're a good a good uh, barbecue master I, uh, I'm more like that. Yeah, the barbecue is more like my space too. Even though I, I'm going to confess something. I took uh, classes in a restaurant years ago, uh, and I learned a few a few things. But then I didn't practice much after that. And uh, so again, I just go back to something quick. You know, uh, we have a lot of people saying uh, hello from uh, all over the world. Look at that: South Africa, California, uh, Spain. Uh, somebody says steak. Okay, so we're getting people hungry here. Canada, uh, Peru, London, and Philippines. Wow, look at that. Excellent. Well, uh, let's talk about cooking now, but some of the type of cooking. We're talking about malware. And not just malware, but, you know, sometimes we just say malware, but we're really uh, talking about attackers' weapons or, you know, the tools attackers use uh, against, uh, against our organizations. Uh, now, tell us a little bit more about what is Vitostol. I think pretty much everybody here would, have heard right about virus uh, but not everybody knows how it works. What do you guys do? Yeah, very quick. Um, basically, imagine you receive something suspicious and you don't know what is that. If you allow to virus total, we will be scanning this against, I think it's 70 something antiviruses plus many security tools. And you will have a better idea if this looks like malicious or not. And thanks to this, we have probably the biggest database of malware which we use also um, to do research. And we have, uh, it's actually an ecosystem, it's an open platform for all security researchers who can experiment and they can find all kinds of trends. They, they have a very good visibility thanks to all these people who upload anything suspicious to virus total. So it's used, well, probably you do as well, <laughs> everywhere for malware research and to understand how things are moving. Um, Basically, when you're using it, it's kind of a wall of malware. You can search on all of our database, whatever um, hint you have in order to understand, like, oh, I found this. What is this in reality? And you get the whole context. So, yeah, I'm happy to discuss trends with you guys just yes, because we have um, 
probably a complementary visibility. You see things we don't, we see things that maybe you don't. Um, it's always interesting to share all this in order to have a better understanding how things are moving. Uh, you use uh, an interesting word, complementary, right? Uh, Dimitri, we were discussing this before. Uh, even even you guys, which you know, you have a, a, a tremendous visibility over all of these different things that get uploaded to your platform, but nobody has all the visibility, right, uh, Dimitri? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so when we think about threat intelligence, uh, we need to think about many things, but one of them is like how to complement or to extend our visibility over uh, not the platforms only, but let's say like industry sources uh, where you can actually see it and see those uh, threads coming from. So uh, VirusTotal is one of the greatest sources I know everybody use and also us. And at BlackBerry, we also use our own telemetry, uh, which comes from the products we have installed with the customers. So uh, this is about like, uh, it's like a puzzle right someone has like one piece probably that piece is bigger than other piece someone has like a small piece but in order to see the full picture you need to to to, to complete that puzzle you need to go and find those pieces and to put them together so wider your visibility greater um, understanding of the threats you may have so a better um, actions you may take uh, you may lessen the risks in a, in a proper way, like in a better way. And it, it, it's all about that. Right. It's all about context, right? As we usually say in this in this industry. Great. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about what we're seeing. You know, what Vitasol is seeing, and uh, uh, you know, we can we can talk about why does it matter, or you know, to to our audience, like what can organizations do about this. For example, we, we seem to, to see a lot more, we talked about that in our latest uh, BlackBerry quarterly threat report, uh, a lot more cross-platform malware. So that means you know malware that is going to execute the same code can execute on Windows, Linux, maybe Mac OS, like different platforms. Um, uh, first of all, let me just ask, is that something that you, you guys are seeing uh, at Vitalstotal? Uh, even... You know, um, determining some trends is not that easy because you can see some peaks and this could be because of some very successful campaign, could be because of polymorphic malware. I agree with you, this kind of malware started a few years ago and it's basically good for attackers because it's difficult to detect in some cases just because it's, it's using different techniques and at the same time it can be reused for different platforms. I wouldn't say it's super useful. I think in this same direction, rather than uh, multi-platform, maybe a scripted-based malware is something also in the same lines um, that maybe is a bit more popular. So uh, short answer, not sure this is a trend, like growing trend, but definitely something that started a few years ago and still is happening. So I guess depending on the campaign in particular, it can be at some point more like trendy than uh, at any other time. What type of uh, scripting languages, for example, that, uh, are you referring to that you guys see? Well, I, I think PowerShell is the winner <laughs> and for, a, for quite some time. Um, we see this now integrated in some unusual formats for distribution. For instance, in the past, we used to see macros all the time, right? Macros were the king for distributed malware. Now we see strange stuff like um, OneNote, uh, uh, documents mm. that are linked to PowerShell just yes, because the perception for the user is different and they don't really know that they're executing something uh, behind what they are opening. I think PowerShell probably is the most popular one in terms of scripting languages at the moment. Yeah, it's it's interesting, right? We've been talking about PowerShell for so long. Uh, nothing, nothing really new, but we see attackers, they keep using this and I guess uh, Dimitri, right? If they they use this, is because it it still works. Yeah, absolutely. Because we use PowerShell for both. It's uh, you know the threat actors they use it for malicious purposes, but we also use it for legitimate purposes, automation, administration, mm -hmm. even like auxiliary tools. You can write a quick script which will help you to sort out data. Uh, so it's 
it's uh, it's the same old example it's like a knife right you can use it for both uh, to i don't know to cut the butter and to <laughs> and to eat it with bread or you you know to stumble someone it's uh, so it's that's about that I like it since we're talking about cooking, right? Like I like the knife, the knife illustration. Um, uh, I'm not sure how you kill someone with a butter knife. <laughs> <laughs> it will be like hard, a hard task. <laughs> but repeatedly, right? Repeatedly. Well, we, we repeatedly see a lot of PowerShell on on our networks uh, when it comes to to malware. And I, I'm I'm looking at the report you guys um, uh, wrote recently. Uh, this is lessons learned from 2022, and we have the link uh, here that. Anna is uh, probably going to share with us uh, soon to this uh, Vitostal blog. There you go. Thank you, Anna. And uh, in this report, which, uh, you guys talk about the increasing in uh, uh, URLs and phishing attacks, also malicious PDF files. And I was like, wow, that's, that's interesting, right? It's the good old PDF back. You see a lot more of this. This is interesting, right? We also were like, this cannot be right. And I remember I was discussing this with our colleagues at Gmail and they were like, yeah, we also saw the same pic. And we were like, really? And in reality, uh, let's change the perception of malicious here because usually we are thinking there is some exploit in the old times, all the trouble with Adobe, right? Like there was an exploit every, every month or something like this. It's not happening anymore. So please don't worry about this, but what we see is that it is malicious in the sense that they want to commit some fraud. So maybe you just open the PDF and that they are asking you to open, uh, to open an external link. From the external link, you are downloading something. So it's not like so directly like opening, uh, exploiting something and installing the malware. Uh, I think this is also probably circumstantial in the sense uh, there were like very strong uh, campaigns during last year. And we saw this extreme pick of, of PDF. But at the same time, I'm thinking that we see more and more this kind of fraud uh, where you are not directly sending the exploit or the malware itself. You are like redirecting somewhere else. And many times the redirection is some hosting that is legitimate. Um, so we see many legitimate um, servers used as distribution vector. For instance, we saw a lot in Discord during the last uh, few months. and and this is confusing for the user because they see some link opening here and then asking to download something for something that is legitimate so it will not be blocked by uh, any any uh, antivirus uh, in, in the sense of the url or firewall or any other system that you have to block traffic it's more difficult to find in the logs and etc cetera, etc cetera. so Mm, this kind of combination of factors is kind of dangerous because it's very difficult to detect against the good old malware, let's say. And uh, it worries me also that they are getting better. And well, now is time of uh, artificial intelligence, LLMs, and everybody is excited about this. It's very easy, right, to to write something very convincing. Like uh, you don't need to have many skills, and you can do it in any language. So mm, this is worrying me a bit. Like this kind of old fraud probably will be more convincing as time goes on. You know, Vicente, I was wondering how long it would take us to talk about ChatGPT. Yeah, let's, <laughs> let's, let's drink, right? We, like this kind of games that when you mention something, you need to drink. And, and sorry, it's one of the high words now, but reality is that I'm expecting this uh, like, to be visible very soon. So, so that's interesting. Since we're, talk since we're talking about cooking, right, and recipes, I could go into ChatGPT and say, "Hey, you know, I don't know what to cook today. Uh, just give me a recipe for something that I, I don't know. Where chicken, uh, I can cook with chicken or with beef or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Or a vegetarian dish." Um, can can attackers do the same and you know come up with uh, recipes for an attack or maybe for social engineering something that could be convincing? Um, what do you guys think? For social engineering, for sure. I mean, it's extremely good, but actually you can use it also the other way around uh, and you can use it like, hey, what is this PowerShell doing? Mm -hmm. And it's also useful. So all these LLM models can help us also, we as defenders, to to understand quicker what is happening. Um, probably you want to double check, but if you want to have a quick idea, it's also very useful. 
Yes, indeed, indeed. I remember it was like a month ago or two uh, when it just started, and uh, we also ran like a test. Uh, so basically, like a straight question: What kind of encryption is best for ransomware? No, I'm sorry, I can't answer those questions. Okay, so what is the most efficient encryption? Like, okay, buy the the encryption key, buy the protocol, <laughs> and then like you're leading you to it's oh. like, come on. So yeah, definitely, it's up to. Like who's behind the the console, the keyboard, right? And the questions you may ask, uh, and how you're gonna use that information. So there is no, it's not a secret. Yes, it's it's been used by all sort of uh, people, uh, bad and good intentional individuals. So so Dimitri, you social engineer Chat GPT, right? <laughs> no, I don't want to give you that answer, but then you you convinced Chat GPT to give you the answer you were looking for. I like yeah, it. you just split the question, you know, like in pieces. And of course, it's not about, um, you know, saying how to use uh, ChatGPT-like platforms, but definitely uh, that's just a proof of uh, whoever can use it for any purpose. Now, let's let's stay with you, Dima, for a second, because I know Vicente talked about using legitimate infrastructure like Discord uh, to host, uh, uh, well, the payloads, command and control. Uh, we, we have seen a lot of these recently, right? We have seen, um, you know, platforms that are legitimate, that people use for legitimate purposes, that have powerful APIs, and attackers are leveraging that to uh, host their, their payloads, right? Yes, uh, that's mainly because when you look into your network traffic and you see those connections, let's say to legitimate services named such as, I don't know, Telegram, which we, we've seen broadly used by uh, publicly attributed threat actors to Russia, like Romcom and Gamma Redon. Um, it's, uh, it, they use it for everything, like next stage payload, uh, dropping into the system, and also C2s, like communicating with the command and control center. Uh, tomorrow, we are going live with uh, an article about APT29 and also abusing one of the legitimate services and targeting um, a high profile individual is going to be live tomorrow. Again, uh, the the threat actor behind it, Nobelium, um, it's um, it's using that. It's it's using to uh, not to raise a suspicious traffic, let's say, or at least like to to bypass what is blacklisted, even categorized as let's say unknown. It won't be unknown traffic. It will be known as clean. Uh, so it's uh, it's it's something we see that the threat actors, at least from Eastern Europe, they are using it. So that's that's a good recommendation, right? To give uh, uh, to our uh, those who are listening to us, to the organizations, not to trust everything just because it, it's a platform that's out there. Uh, I think uh, you know it's good to to have in mind that if this is if this application is not used in my organization, why would we allow access to it? That that reduces the attack surface. Uh, but now we, we let's talk about ransomware because you know we cannot talk about cybersecurity and intelligence without and malware without talking about ransomware. Um, is it, you know, looking at the report, does it maybe uh, suggest that ransomware is becoming less prevalent or we see less of that? Uh, is it that we only see it now in more like targeted big um, uh, targets? Um, what's your opinion on that, Vicente? Yeah, this is a very good question, right? Like nobody cares about ransomware or at least it's not in the headlines anymore. But reality is, first of all, when we started taking a look a couple of years ago, we saw there is always like a continuous uh, inbound of ransomware from small families that we don't really know or that are not that popular. And it's always there. And at the same time, there are huge peaks from the other families that are more spread. I think at the moment, Mm, probably this massive distribution of ransomware uh, is probably not happening like before. Um, I think it's not that massive. Uh, we, we're talking always in terms of, of course, um, number of samples we see and, and you know, very, very high uh, uh, vision of, of the situation. We are not talking about particular situations and the fact that they don't appear in the headlines as we are saying is like providing the perception that probably is not that big but from time to time we keep seeing that i think most of these criminal groups uh became 
extremely professional with all of these. Um, they have the resources and I still think they are attacking like different kind of targets, but probably it's not as spread as before. I don't know what is the reason, maybe because um, Bitcoin is not so profitable. Um, probably it's not a good explanation, mm. but it's, it's very clear. It still is there. I mean, it's simply that we are not so hyped about this. Now we are probably more interested in other kind of attacks, but some groups are extremely profitable they still have the ability. I don't think there was any um, like, you know, a uh, changer from the defensive side to say, no, we are safe now from ransomware. Because basically, I think they simply adopt the same set of techniques that are working for them, which are well understood. They have the same tool set that they've been using for quite some time. And actually some minor, let's say minor APTs, they are using the same stuff. So the set of Mimikatz and the set of uh, Cobalt Strike and, you know, this kind of, um, well-known procedure in order to get inside of the big team and then spread internally, et cetera, et cetera, is probably there and, and nothing changed, I think, in, in order to say we are safe from that. You know, that that's interesting and, and I would love to to hear what you think, Dima, but I, I think that probably the fact that law enforcement is a lot more aggressive now and they've been going after many of these uh, ransomware gangs, uh, that maybe it's making them a little bit more cautious, right? And maybe they're saying, you know what, instead of like doing this uh, widely against everybody, we're just going to focus on targeted campaigns. Uh, for example, last week, uh, it was announced here in the US, uh, FBI took down a particular uh, criminal group. They went after a ransomware gang that we actually blogged about at BlackBerry uh, some time ago. And we gave some you know, information about this. And we collaborate regularly with law enforcement in this type of... Uh, operations so hopefully that's you know sending a signal to the to the bad guys too yes yes and it's not a secret that most of those groups they are coming from eastern europe so essentially it's uh it's uh russia it's ukraine and in ukraine even during the war we have seen several arrests and uh what's happening as well you see ransomware it's about um money right and sanctions 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 over like everything and it's harder and harder to get uh, to them to the money of course there are still like tips and tricks those cyber criminals use behind it but definitely um, let's say like a, like it was two years ago and today yeah it looks the number of attack is decreasing while the impact yes is the same it's like it's pain it's leaked data it's uh, encrypted data it's public shaming and, th and stuff um still it, it's a life right we know it's a it's a threat which uh, still it's there it's in the wild now talking about uh, you mentioned uh, russia ukraine obviously we're thinking you know nation states uh, apts uh, has anything been changing in that area as well uh, do you see maybe uh, less of these uh, highly targeted attacks um, over the last few months. I, I wanted to add something before jumping into this. Uh, I will let Dima to, to discuss on APT. But I think you said something very interesting, Dima, which is that uh, probably motivations from the attackers stay the same. They want to get money, but the tactic is changing and maybe they're skipping the whole ransomware thingy. They are simply filtrating data and, and hmm. you know, threatening to publish, which is why maybe in some of these attacks we don't identify them as ransomware because simply the data was not even encrypted they were simply stealing the data and for us it's simply a cyber espionage attack what i, what I was trying to say before is that all these uh, know-how and everything that these groups have they still do and still they are targeting different victims but maybe they don't qualify as ransomware just because they don't need to do that anymore it's like wasting time for them but sorry uh Please go that's, ahead. That's a very good, that's a very interesting point. Yeah. And uh, yeah, well, you see, when ge geopolitics define the threat landscape, because it's uh, it's about vehicles, right, to achieve goals. Is it a cyber espionage? Is it data destruction? Whatever it is, it's about taking advantage uh, in cyberspace uh, to take advantage in real life. It can be anything. It can be, I don't know, um, like uh, diplomatic negotiation. It can be a military advantage, whatever. So uh, definitely those campaigns are on. 
and uh, it's not only about let's say the the war in ukraine and russia and ukraine it's about uh, many countries of course involved in that and um, it's been always so in uh, during this last two years we've seen um, many uh, several campaigns you know like in, the interesting part of that like each time we publish something let's say we publish a blog post about a threat actor let's say let's let's say the rom-com right and they learn from our text what did they bad and then they like stay quiet like for a month or two and then they try to improve their mistakes and to get back on track this is what we we've seen and of course it means like of course they are reading our blogs and and we are not um we are not like our goal is to protect um systems right it's it's like malware is malware it's an attack is an attack so we just we we don't uh, we just want to to stop those attacks whatever the source it, it is like from it, whatever country it's coming from that's a good point. And the reality is that many of these attackers, regardless of where they're from, right, regardless whether we consider them APTs or just cyber criminals, they use similar tools. Uh, for example, we have been talking about Cobalt Strike for years, right? Mimi Cats. Um, do we still see these uh, tools, uh, Vicente, uh, being used on a regular basis? Uh, I'm sure about this. Um, from our telemetry, it's funny sometimes you see a new peak of Cobalt Strike that is submitted to Aristotle, followed by a peak of lookups. Like everybody who was affected is like, what is this? What, what is this targeting me? Uh, and still, it's nothing you need to do with uh, malware here. In this, is well, in reality, it's not malware. Cobalt Strike is a legit pen testing tool that was leaked, and nobody, everybody's using it now. But uh, in terms of malware, probably it's not the best for us to see the telemetry just because no matter which version you have you basically just keep going and reusing but i think this tool set is absolutely common you see in almost every attack and you cannot hear maybe a metapreter or i don't know but in reality this is something that makes also apt attacks very indistinguishable between them and from other cyber criminal attacks uh, why spending money and efforts in creating something new, dedicated, which has clear attribution if you are detected when you can use the use all stuff, right? This could be another of the reasons why, you know, for a few years, we were finding like a new APT group every week. Like, oh my God, we are in APT 36 now. No, it's 37, really? And now it's like 41 next year, maybe 42. It's like slowing down the pace, at least in how we identify uh, adversaries. I think simply the paradigm changes. So, sorry, Dimitri, if you want to go. No, 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 I'm here. Also listen. I, I was, uh, yeah, no, I'm just enjoying the conversation and thinking about, um, you know, the tools and thinking about your telemetry and your perspective, right, as, as Vilus Total. I'm sure you see a lot of uh, payloads that exploit vulnerabilities, specific CVEs. Uh, do, do you guys see a trend there as well? Um, like, you know, sometimes people think that, uh, well, the zero days, right? But but do you still see like a lot of old CVEs being exploited in the wild? Old ones are still around just because like every exploit kit will include like the full pack. Uh, what is interesting now is that every time there is a vulnerability, immediately we find the exploit. So the speed of adoption for any vulnerability is incredible. It's like everybody has the exploit in their pockets and they're using as they need it. Um, in terms of which vulnerability is more successful, yeah, I think it depends on the season, let's say. Uh, for instance, last year was Fojina vulnerability, by far the most used by attackers. Um, it really depends, um, but in terms of uh, uh, speed of the adoption, I think this is probably the most interesting. Yeah, Folina, right? Any any type of uh, uh, vulnerability, I guess, in dependencies that are embedded, right, in a lot of uh, different places, that also uh, uh, triggers a lot of these attacks. Which you know leads me to probably maybe the last question for for today. 
uh, supply chain attacks. That's on top of the agenda of a lot of different organizations. Uh, I'm pretty sure as we go into the rest of 2023, we're going to listen to a lot more of these, uh, you know, scenarios. Um, is there any reported attacks, anything that you know about supply chain attacks uh, from Vitalstall's perspective? The, these are very difficult to, to find just because it's in the supply chain, right? So the resulting problem will be in some legitimate software that suddenly you realize something is, is not right. But we started monitoring some stuff like um, different Python packages and different packages that are used by other, um, well, as we were discussing at the very beginning, right? About the scripting languages, but by many other vendors and it's interesting because you see that some of them suddenly they appear to be malicious and you see that they are implemented and included in many other legitimate software packages and suddenly it's a big problem um not easy to to find uh we don't have like any super specific for this but if you have any ideas and you want to play with virus at all to monitor these kind of attacks i think it's very interesting because for real, it's a huge, uh, let's say, landscape of different possibilities you can do. Um, I cannot predict, but the thing is that any potential problem has a huge implication. Like it could be like some certificates being stolen and suddenly they are being reused by attackers, right? Or it could be that they are introducing malicious code in any include package very difficult to predict the impact but every time it happens it's huge uh, dimitri you were mentioning right uh, that uh before we we're talking about some of these attacks that we're seeing uh the reuse of certificates or stealing them right uh that can lead to, to yeah to by, by pass, right to even like if the product is designed to detect detect certain tools or certain techniques yeah once it's uh signed electronically uh, it's probably it, it it might become like out of protection scope because it's like it passed the security validations to it's like no it's a legitimate certificate never seen before it's a valid certificate issued I don't know like recently and it, so yeah there are many tricks of course to to do those bypasses and especially you see there are regions like Latin America and many others were most of those attacks like interesting attacks they escape from our visibility because like they're super regional super even like sometimes in one same province might be because there are a lot of uh small developers you know like small like uh companies i don't know five five people and they're working on accounting software who knows what's happening in there like mm. who knows you know like <laughs> there are 50 customers in, in one same country and uh, many things may happen there. And yeah, we just don't have visibility most of the time over those uh, micro like ecosystems uh, where supply chain may happen or happening. Maybe we just don't see that for now. Like little companies that they just produce, uh, you know, some free software, right? A dictionary for whatever, right? It's, it's out there. It's public. Maybe it was one guy that, you know, build that. Uh, during the weekends and just put it out there. Yeah, who's going to be monitoring that? Yeah. Well, this is, a, I think, a good uh, point to wrap it up. And uh, to wrap it up, I would like to ask you, go around the table, the virtual table, and ask you what are your recommendations based on the trends, based on what we're seeing? Uh, let's start with our guest, uh, Vicente. What, what would you recommend? Uh, as we were saying at the very beginning, what is threatened or right and how it can be used, providing this context, I think I recommend everyone to keep an eye on what's happening because, yeah, sometimes something is like breaking news and but we are not paying attention and then it, it comes to us. So the having like these monitoring capabilities, checking what's happening, what's new, seeing how it evolves and preparing based on that, I think is absolutely essential. So. That would be my recommendation. Simply keep an eye on what's happening and, and understand how this can be impactful for you so you can be prepared beforehand. It's easier than being proactive here than, than being reactive later, uh, absolutely. And at the same time, I think it's the best way to design, to design your own security strategy. 
I like it. Um, you know, and since you're a strategist, right, we need to talk about strategy. We have to have a strategy. Yes. Dimitri, what do you think? Yeah, it's it's uh, it's it's like it depends on where where you work. It's not the same, let's say, to protect a bank, and to protect uh, I don't know, like a military institution or the government, and even like depending on the country. Because what is your threat module, right? Who are your threat actors? What weapons do they use? How they use it? Um, are my products even designed? To protect me against those or it's something like out of protection scope is it well configured like properly like a configuration maybe some settings are missed missing so all those things you may discover only if you have threat intelligence because if you just have products if you're just like sitting there and thinking no i got the best product uh well probably something most most definitely uh stuff like severe stuff mm. will be just you know happening while you may think you're protected because you invested and you have like really good products but probably you, like there is a lack of context lack of anticipation lack of action and based on this knowledge of cti cyber threat intelligence knowledge so it's uh that there is a clear need for that because if i were on this side like in a company protecting the company the company work i would rely on cyber threat intelligence otherwise how can i do that exactly i totally agree with you we, we call i like to call this think red act blue right think as an attacker know the attackers techniques their motivations uh specific to your industry your organization and then translate that to a defensive uh, uh strategy well, uh, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to have you, you know, both, uh, especially, you know, our guest, uh, Vicente, uh, with, uh, with us. Thank you so much for making the time. Thank you very much. It was my pleasure. And in order to stay uh, well informed on what's happening, uh, we mentioned the, um, the Vital Storal blog. We also have the quarterly threat report from uh, BlackBerry. And uh, I think, uh, Anna, if you can share the link to the previous one. There we go. The first one we released this year in January. And since we're talking about cooking, we're cooking now the second report that you will see uh, uh, very soon out, out there, right? With the latest uh, trends and, uh, well, things that we need to know about what's happening in, in the cybersecurity world. You also have our uh, Twitter accounts. Feel free to uh, continue the conversation with us, either you know LinkedIn or on Twitter. And uh, we'll be very happy to, uh, to share more information with you. Again, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.